You gotta stop homebrewing those spells. Until you listen to these five homebrew tips I have for creating your own spells and the first step you should always take before creating a spell. If you didn't know already, here on this channel, I'd love to help people homebrew their games to have more fun. For a long time, I've wanted to give you guys a homebrew spell system, but I just really wanted it to be absolutely next level and it's finally ready. It's, <laughs> I'm so excited. And what spurred and sparked this video into existence were my patrons because every single month they vote on video topics that they want to see, which was the last week's video on rewarding players in new and different ways. And they also vote on what resources that I make and create with me and my team every single month in these monthly PDFs called DC Playbooks. Each playbook has a big feature and a bunch of different magic items, monsters, adventures, and a ton of different stuff to help you with your DM prep and boost up your game. So for the month of April, we are finally ready to give the build a spell system. Oh my gosh, it's so exciting. That's why I'm making two videos. This week is talking about everything you need to know before you get your mind right before you even create a spell and things you have to just have at the baseline level and then next week's video i'm going over the 12 different things to be able to tweak in the different knobs and levers you can adjust when you are homebrewing your spells if you're too impatient you want to get your hands on it right now or you just want to support what i do here to be able to make more content like this and check out my patreon and link down in the description and you always get this month's pdf and the month before i always try and give my patrons the most value possible or you could also pick up anything that i have over my website also linked in the description so that out of the way now let's get into this video all of us have wanted to or have homebrewed spells whether we're a dungeon master trying to come up with some cool evil villain spell or a player that wants to really push the limits of a certain spell in just a little different way so dungeon masters i hope this helps you and you could also send this video to those curious players to give them some sort of structure before they start homebrewing some crazy stuff. Man, have I seen some crazy homebrew spells that are just, not, just no. In fact, we're gonna do this. Leave a comment down below of what type of homebrew spell you wanna see. And in next week's video, whenever I do all this homebrew tweaks and knobs and stuff, I will homebrew a spell down from the comments and create it from scratch just for you. You can be as vague as you want and I'll snag the most interesting one up and then throw it down in next week's video. But now let's get into those five tips. The number one thing to keep in mind when homebrewing a spell in Dungeons and Dragons are the tiers of play. Usually in Dungeons and Dragons, you can think of the tiers of play broken up into the five levels, one through five, six through 10, and so on. And if you look at cantrip specifically, they usually scale at these levels and increase their damage dice at fifth, 11th, and 17th level. I personally think that all cantrips is scale at fifth, 11th, and 17th level. I did an entire video on that. I'll link that down in the description and there's an entire PDF that I have of just that specifically for a whole bunch of scaling cantrips like friends and all these other things. I feel like should scale Scale, even though they're not damaged, but I digress. So these levels are important mainly because at fifth level, you unlock third level spells. And oh my God, they are so good. It's the biggest jump in the game. All the marshals get extra attack at fifth level. All the spellcasters get their third level spell slots. It's crazy. Fireball, fly, revivify, like <laughs> you're just changing the game across the board. So when you're homebrewing spells, there's a big difference between a second level spell and a third level spell. But this gap between spells doesn't infinitely scale because going from third to fourth level is a jump in power, but not near as much as two to three. And why 11th level is important, because that's when sixth level spells unlock, and at 17th level is important because, oh my God, ninth level spells unlock. So then you have your third, sixth, and ninth level spells as a nice little progression for magic. The second tip for homebrewing spells is spell progression. The Dungeons and Dragons has already laid it out for you. There's a lot of spells that are kind of similar. I've always used the reference of Fire Bolt as a cantrip, scaling up to Scorching Ray, scaling up to Fireball. There's these different spells, whether they're thematically similar, like Command, Charm Person, Charm Monster, etc., or Teleport is really the best option. These are basically progressive spells that level up up to the next and higher versions. At second level, at first level, you can't teleport. There's not a first level teleport spell. That's a cool thing to keep in mind. But what if you could homebrew a first level teleport spell you better look at misty step first the misty step is a second level spell that gives you a 30 foot teleport as a bonus action oh my gosh Sounds amazing. But then at third level, you get Thunder Step, which is much more different. It's no longer a bonus action. Now it's upgraded to an action. And it's 90 feet now, which is three times farther. But maybe you didn't need that much distance in the first place. Maybe just 30 feet is all you needed, right? You stay with me. And it also deals damage in the thunderous boom and also makes a sound, which that sound is technically a negative side effect, which can help balance spells. If you add on negative effects to them, it helps balance them out. If you feel like a spell is too strong, it makes a huge loud sound. 
sound. Okay, that's kind of okay, okay, okay. We'll go one step farther at Dimension Door, a fourth level spell, is a 500 foot teleport as an action, but it doesn't deal any damage. So you're trying to see them in comparison to one another. So you start to put that homebrew thinking cap on and you can see what pockets there are to fit in. Or do I want to make, all right, I want something more than Misty Step. So it has to be, it can't be a second level spell because then I would just upgrade Misty Step at second level. That's not fair. That's you know, power creep or whatever. So then I got to do love third level spell. Okay, so I now have a reference point of Thunder Step, but I don't really want to deal damage for it and I want to keep it as a bonus action. Okay, and honestly, maybe right there, the thought that I just had pop into my head right now live, I have not thought this through, so don't, don't quote me on this, but the damage reduction of losing the dice and damage that you deal from Thunder Step converting it to a bonus action that might feel like a fair balance and takeaway and the fact that it has a thunderous boom sound i feel like just off the top of my head right now i feel like that's pretty solid so misty step now becomes fog step which is a third level spell for a 90 foot teleport as a bonus action whoa that's crazy oh my god misty step fog step thunder step look at these look, we got we need to get some more steps here i literally didn't plan this but the next thing i have on my list here is far step which is a fifth level spell so now far step is very interesting to me it now converts back down to a bonus action to be able to cast it okay cool that's good and then it's also concentration which in general i think i'm okay with that too as far as this uh, this ideal teleport spell i'm looking for but the range now has been reduced to 60 feet and there's no thunderous booming sound but honestly for a fifth level spell i feel like that might be a bit much and i know i'm now going against rules as written but i just said to respect the rules as written and in general in all of my homebrews i do respect and stay true to the rules as written but there are going to be some spells if you were to rank all the spells in DD, there's plenty of videos that probably do that but if you were to rank these spells there are going to be some underperforming spells and some overperforming spells I cast Fireball. So right now, this is another little homebrew thought I want to share with you guys off the top of my head here, is I do feel like Far Step as a fifth level spell to have all of those things in, in comparison to the big picture that we just talked about is a little bit underwhelming. So maybe if Far Step was a fourth level spell, would it be too much? These are the type of things you need to think about. So maybe if you took Far Step and d dialed it down to a fourth level spell, kept the concentration, kept everything, but took the range from 60 down to 30, it gives you basically a Misty Step aura of concentration. Misty Steps a second level spell. This would be a fourth level spell in this random little homebrew we did just now. So that would kind of feel good. Or maybe if you like the thunder effect of Thunder Step and you feel like Far Step's a little slacking, maybe you add a little bit of dice damage to pulse out around the Far Step every time you do it. And you can choose to just teleport with these thunderous booms. And again, off the top of my head, I'm going to look up right now. I don't know the th damage of Thunder Step off the top of my head, but it's apparently 3d10 thunder damage. So right now I'm thinking about for this Far Step thing, maybe I do 2 d10 thunder damage and that might feel good fifth level spell that feels a little weak you homebrew it to add 2d10 thunder damage to it and now it's like a continuous thunder step i know i spent a little time talking about these teleportation spells but it's very important to keep in mind these sister spells or progression spells so that you can keep in mind where to bounce around from whether you're thinking about damage casting time range whatever it is because it didn't even get into the other spells like teleportation circle which completely changes the game across the board for teleportation and then seven Seventh level is actual teleport. Oh my gosh. Jump from fifth level up to seventh level. Teleport is insane. And then there's gate at ninth level, which gets you across the planes of existence. And you're just absolutely crazy at this point. But you can see the progression from little old Misty Step all the way up to gate. And honestly, right now, I want to homebrew a first level spell of a teleport, which honestly might just be off the top of my head. It would be an action to teleport 30 feet. Boom. We'll call it droplet step or <laughs> drop step. Ooh. Moving on to number three now is about the damage and the effects of these things specifically the damage type is what i want to kind of get into here is the type of damage your spell deals if this is the type of spell that deals damage and most homebrew spells kind of are okay but fire in my opinion is like the default damage type for what would be just normal damage in general things like cold and poison tend to have other effects like movement slowing disadvantage poison condition so these spells that have these small minor effects or even maybe big major effects are going to deal reduced damage should deal reduced damage to their counterparts that don't have any effects going on like firebolt 1d10 oh but ray of frost takes that 1d10 down to a 1d8 and they're and the target's speed is reduced by 10 small minor effect reduced dice and then we got force damage also to think about usually force damage doesn't have any additional effects of some sort of other things going on and force damage's main awesome thing about it is 
most things just can't resist it. So it deals less damage because it's force damage, which is like the holy grail of damage types. So I'm looking at spells and evaluating the balance of them to make sure that they pass the homebrew code and could get the DC stamp of approval, whatever that means. If I'm looking at a spell that deals fire damage compared to force damage, I'm going to look at those differently and the force damage is going to mean a little more. And just to address them all, at least, because I know people would leave in the comments if I left something out, that acid and lightning, I feel like are similar to fire in general. And I feel like psychic and thunder are in the weird gray area sometimes because there's a lot of psychic spells that have some sort of effect, whether it's a major effect with all the different crazy stuff you can do with intelligent saving throw things or minor effects like losing a reaction. But not many things resist psychic and thunder. So those are pretty valuable. But a lot of times uh, it, with thunder, it could come with deafen or some other disadvantage thing. But it should be on your mind what effects you're adding to the spell and what damage types you're making the spell when you're thinking about where its power is. Number four, I just got to say this one because it's this important is cantrips can't heal okay now i am about to contradict myself entirely but make sure if you create a spell that's a cantrip it just can't have an infinite healing i see this all the time in a subclass or in some sort of features i just was homebrewing the mass combat system for alcana's almanac and where there was a thing in there that had oh, a healing but then if you let infinite healing go with no cost then outside of combat Right now, inside of combat, cantrip heals might make sense because it's you heal this much and you spin a cantrip to heal. But then out of combat, it breaks your game entirely because somebody can just, oh, we're out of combat and we're all hurt. I'm just going to cantrip heal everybody up over the next you know minute. But now to contradict myself entirely, there is two super sweet homebrews, one that I did and one that my friend Purius did. He's a super legit homebrewer as part of the team. Uh, we created two different homebrew cantrips for healing that are based on your hit dice. And there's a component of you have to spend your hit dice so you have to have a resource to be able to balance this thing right but i do think it's worth noting as far as healing goes to make this and watch out again that whole video breaks down the healing cantrip and the whole thing like that it's also in the pdf but i just had to say it. the number five tip to keep in mind when homebrewing spells is the cast time please if you're new at homebrewing only homebrew spells that are in action to cast. They are far easier to homebrew. Most spells are in action to cast, so you're going to be able to have more references, like I referenced earlier in tip number two. You're going to be able to compare and contrast things more like. If you want to have a line spell, you have lots of different line spells to look at. If you want a cone, a ray of frost, you know, an area of effect, there are lots of different spells that are actions, so you have a lot of rooms and reference points to work with. And then, once you start getting into bonus action territory who starts getting a little bit lot because there's not a lot of cantrips stay with me here there's not a lot of cantrips here that you can cast as a bonus action so the rules is written spells when you cast a spell as an action you can't then cast a spell as a bonus action also so with there being not a lot of bonus action cantrips which is also a part of balance in the game that I should in general reference out here with this whole action economy thing is if you made a bonus action cantrip that was an attack oh my gosh that might just break the game or whatever as long as it wasn't like well it's just 1d4 but then you might slow your game down because you have a bunch of like every spell caster picks it up now and they cast the spell as their action and then they every single time use the bonus action to shoot out some cantrip so you got to keep that in mind but now back to switch this back over is whenever you create bonus action spells that's very strong potentially because then they always have their action free to cast some sort of cantrip so if you create a big damaging spell as a bonus action okay well first of all why are you even doing that but we'll get to that here in a second. I don't want to spoil the spoil the big first step here. But another thing to keep in mind is reactions. Oh my gosh. Reaction spells are very powerful. Shield is broken, essentially. Shield is very, very strong. And the fact that it's a reaction, Hellish Rebuke, reaction, ah, right? You're able to burn spells to be able to use this reaction to cast a spell. Now, as far as my stuff goes, I, I'm not going to go check the book right now on this, but I like the, the whole thing I just said about spell casting. If you cast a spell as an action, you can't cast one as a bonus action. I would let people use a spell slot as a reaction, even if they already spent a, a spell slot or whatever. But I feel like that's right. Anyway, reaction spells are very strong because those martial classes need their reaction for those opportunity attacks that happen all the time but the caster of people they don't really have that much stuff to use a reaction for so if you create too powerful of a reaction spell they're going to pick it up because they can essentially cast it for free assuming they have the spell slots for it and especially at higher level they might just keep burning those first level spell slots on all these cool reaction spells if you start homebrewing those and then there's ritual spells which take one minute 10 minutes or longer to cast and those are a lot easier to balance because 
you can kind of do some crazier stuff because under the confines of a combat, nobody, I know there's probably times where it's happened before, but nobody's going to get a one minute. I've never seen it happen. Comment down below if you've said it had happened before. But if there's a one player casting a one minute spell for 10 minutes, they spend their action to just channel a spell for one minute. Dragon Ball Z style charging up and then it finally releases. It better be a crazy spell. But whenever you're homebrewing these ritual spells, there are some examples of ritual spells. And in general, you're not going to have the high chance of breaking the game because it's probably not going to ever go off during combat. But be careful for that player cheese where they are about to start a fight and someone like all right i'm gonna start channeling it and then they go like the round before that goes off or all that kind of stuff so oh, watch out for the cheese okay so now this part is big this is the first step of homebrewing any spell i wanted to say it in this video in the next video i'm going to go into homebrewing a spell but i really wanted to separate it or it just would have been a crazy long video i don't even know i've, I've been rambling about teleport spells for too long already but the number one first step that you always should take is define the fantasy that might be a weird first step that you were thinking maybe you were thinking about with action economy of which it should have been like i don't want you to think there yet because you need to preface your brain and prime your brain and get it in the place of what you're trying to create i did the same thing with my build a dragon system of what kind of dragon are you going to create what kind of homebrew monster are you creating oh, you have to stop and get yourself to think what am i wanting to do what am i wanting to get across at the table if you're a player what effect are you trying to do what fantasy is your character trying to accomplish what do you want to be able to do that you currently can't if you're a player there's a lot of homebrew spells that i wanted to fly so i heavily heavily based it around the fly spell and the levitate spell and I used those as a reference point for balance when I wanted to make a casting type of class that like flew a little bit. And I used some inspiration from other subclasses that had some flying features that they could fly when they cast a spell to get 10 feet of a fly movement before they had to land, stuff like that. Again, you can use subclasses as reference point too. There's another little bonus tip there. But my fantasy was flying and I wanted to do it in a way that was that was balanced and fair and all that kind of stuff. And as a dungeon master, if you have you and your player working together or you're doing it by yourself and you just want to homebrew some spells, use the fantasy of what am I trying to accomplish and get your head in that space before you do it. Because if you're in that space, you're probably not going to try and come up with some bonus action meteor thing that you want to be able to throw down. Or maybe you do and you can go to some spells that melts meteor and other things where you cast something on yourself as an action. And then maybe it takes a bonus action to shoot it out after that. And there's some cool stuff you can do. There's also some cool stuff you can do to reference my video from last week where you can explore this spell if your player loves us cast a spell in a certain way and they want to homebrew it by just taking the spell and making a little tweak to it that could be a cool narrative impact on the game how did they do it did they find a, a spell caster maybe this has happened in my games before there was a spell caster that cast some really cool homebrew spell and it was kind of similar it was a geomancer and they like cast rock on their body and they had this like rock gundam suit it really spoke to one of my players and they wanted to figure out how to do it so in the whenever they classically kidnapped or what, what do you call it? captured is what i guess whenever they they tie them up and hold them there, he got the person to teach him how to cast that spell and there's some narrative role play moments there they kept him alive and they it wasn't just a really quick like oh you just do this with your hands like no they had to role play with his i need my hands to show you and they had to like release him and there's some really cool thing and they had to work for it and had some little role play back and forth with this npc that cast this really cool spell and then my player learned that spell and that's a cool narrative interaction to tell a story with and have the character unlock cool new things and then sometimes you might realize whenever all, what's the goal you want and what's the intention and all this other kind of stuff you might realize that you don't even have to homebrew a spell and you just reflavor a current spell that already exists kind of some of the stuff i was talking about with all the teleport spells maybe if you wanted to have a thunderstep spell have a continuous effect and you like the 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 concept of teleporting around that would be pretty cool so then you just barely tweak one spell maybe adjust its spell slot maybe adjust some other things and just take these spells and you're not doing it from scratch the system that i have in next week's video is a full from scratch system and and it's also something you can apply towards current spells to help you with that. But maybe you just want to tweak a normal spell or reflavor it and just change the damage like from fireball to acid ball ice ball just change the element type maybe or maybe in like we talked about with cantrips firebolt is 1d10 and ray of frost is 1d8 Ooh, but it slows things down maybe you have scorching ray and instead of dealing let me 2d6 yeah 2d6 damage so instead of dealing 2d6 damage in three different rays you wanted to make a ice ray <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm terrible at naming spells. That's one thing I'm very bad at. I cannot help you name spells. I'll help you homeroom, but I can't name spells to save my life. To get you in my head real quick, I'm thinking 2d6 is similar to 1d12, and if I scale down a 1d12 to a 1d10, now here we go. It would deal three 1d10 rays would shoot out, and the targets hit by those rays would have their movement speed reduced by 10. We took the principles of cantrips and the damage spell effects from, I think, tip was tip number three, and added extra effects, but scaled down the dice damage, and we just created a cool ice ray spell. Maybe if that ice ray spell hits all three to the one target, that 30 feet of movement speed, if it got hit three times, 10, 10, 10, it would now not be able to move. What a cool spell. Yeah, cool, like, ray, ice, ice. Anyway, if you liked all that stuff, you're gonna love next week's video. Leave me comments down below what type of spell you wanna see, and you can go crazy with it. I don't even know what I'm gonna see down there in the comments. Uh, again, if you do wanna support these crazy ideas that I have, that I have now, and because of my patrons, I have a team that I have to be able to support what I do here, and I wouldn't be able to have that team if I didn't have my patrons to be able to support this thing and let this thing grow into becoming more than just myself, into becoming a team with artists that can make PDFs and format the PDFs to look really really good so thank you for making all of that possible my patrons are up on the screen right now somewhere thank you all so much i can't wait to keep homebrewing with you guys and thinking outside the box peace